all day long. We have been thinking and speaking the word I. In fact, not just all day long, but throughout our entire lives. We have continuously referred to I. What does this word I refer to in our actual experience? It obviously refers to that ha that which has remained ever present with us throughout our lives. When you were a five-year-old girl or boy, you referred to yourself as I. Likewise, the ten-year-old, the twenty-year-old, the thirty-year-old, etc. Always, I was at the center of experience. And there was not a moment when this I was not present. Even in deep sleep we say, we refer to the experience of deep sleep by saying, I slept, which is an acknowledgement of the presence of our self. Even in deep sleep we say, I dreamt, I was present throughout my dreams. and throughout the waking state all experience is referred to our self, I. So ask yourself what is it that has remained with me all my life? What is it that has never been parted from me for a single moment? A thought disappears every time it comes to an end. So our thoughts are always being parted from us. They are always vanishing. So I cannot possibly refer to a thought or an image. That is, it cannot possibly refer to the mind. Have any of your feelings remained with you all your life? Obviously not. So we cannot refer to a feeling when we say, I. Has your body remained with you as an actual experience all your life? No. All we know of the experience of the body is a collection of intermittent sensations and perceptions. No one has ever experienced a continuous body. All we know of the apparently continuous body are discontinuous sensations and perceptions. So I cannot possibly refer to a body. And yet we use the word I almost more than any other word. I is the most important thing in our lives. And yet, strangely, we have a very vague idea about what this I is. If I were to suggest to you, take the word traffic and follow that thought to its referent. Our attention would all go in roughly the same direction to the sound of the traffic. 
if I were to suggest take the thought foot. Our attention would all go in a very specific direction towards the experience that we call my foot. Now take the thought I and follow it wherever it takes you. Having established already that I doesn't refer to a mind or a body. That is to a thought, an image, a feeling or a sensation. If we follow the thought I, it will eventually lead to the end of thinking. The thought I is like a doorway in the back of the mind. If we go through that doorway, if we try to follow thought through that doorway, it takes us out of the mind. Thought comes to an end as it goes through that door. Instead of following thought outwards towards the object or objective quality, trace it back in the opposite direction. And don't let it stop with any object. If you find yourself thinking, just ask yourself, where are my thoughts going? They will always be going away from yourself towards an object or an objective quality. Just gently turn round and follow the thought back in the opposite direction. To the source out of which it has arisen. Follow it back through that empty door in the back of the mind. All that remains when we have passed through this door, it's just an image of course, at the back of the mind is pure objectless knowing. The stuff out of which all thinking is made, but not the thinking of anything, just pure knowing, pure awareness without an object, pure consciousness. It is this consciousness that is the substance of all thinking. And in the absence of thinking, this pure consciousness or awareness simply remains as it is, empty, pure empty knowing, not the knowing of anything, just pure knowing, like empty space before it has been filled up with any objects. But it's not a physical space, it's a knowing space, an aware space, in which there is just itself just the knowing of itself before it knows anything, full of itself, full of pure objectless knowing. Dimensionless awareness, full of itself but empty of objects. Just abide knowingly as this empty awareness.
I, I get to this, the, this last thing where I can't go any further back than the noticing of all this noticing. I can't go any further back, but my attention is, I mean, there's, my body starts to get flustered and all like angry. Where is it? Where is it? But I can't convince, my mind can't, except, doesn't know that it's impossible to convince my mind. My attention won't be satisfied. And so it seems to me that I am not, I am not. There's nothing more, there's nothing more to say. <laughs> Well, for someone that believes that I am not, you use the word I an awful lot. <laughs> so you've been calling yourself I all your life. The five-year-old boy called himself I, the 16-year-old, etc. Yeah. And you say, um, I had a dream last night, or I slept deeply last night. So whatever you mean by the word I, is that element of your experience that remains consistently present throughout the three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping and, and has remained consistently present all your life. So what would qualify in your experience for I? What element of your experience remains consistently present throughout all experience? When you say I sense I or you're saying, I know I. Mm -hmm. are, are these two different eyes? Is there one eye that knows and another eye that is known? For instance, going back to this, this uh, sensation that you first spoke of, that, that you call I, and then you realize that there is something bigger than that, which you call amnes, which is noticing the, let's call it the eye contraction. But what would you call that which notices or is aware of this Contra this contraction. It is I. Okay, so now we have two eyes. We have the eye, which is this, this knot in your in your forehead and your chest, which is a sensation, and then you have the the eye that notices that. So, w w which of these two eyes satisfies the, 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 the this criteria that we've just agreed on? That that eye must be that part of your experience that is always present. They're both always there. It just depends how my attention is constricted or They're both relaxed. always there. The, the sensation, this sensation. The sensation, has, I... I, I how, the, how old are you, Jackson? 26. 26. Did this sensation, this, this knot in the chest you've talked about, it's been there for 26 years? No. No, but you have been yourself for 26 years. You have been I. You have been calling yourself I for 26 years. But this, this knot in your chest that you also call it has not been with you for 26 years. In fact, it has not even been present all, all day today. It comes and goes in your experience. It's an, mm. it's an object of your experience. It's a sensation. But it, it, it appears and disappears. But it appears and disappears to you. It is you that is aware of it. Do you consider yourself to be any of your individual thoughts? Quite right. But why not? Because I watch them. You watch them go. And do, do you consider yourself to be uh, the sight of this room or the sound of my voice? No. Why not? So they're the same. Same reason. But why do you consider yourself to be this knot in the chest or in the forehead when it also comes and goes like your thoughts and the sight of this room and the sound of my voice. Bad habit. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a habit. I mean, you, you've also been educated, conditioned by your culture to believe that this knot is synonymous with yourself and your culture has told you the world is not synonymous with yourself. So, But yeah, it's a habit that comes from your conditioning. But when you, when you look at it, when you investigate that habit, is it a legitimate habit? Is this tension in my chest or behind the eyes, in my forehead, r really what I essentially am? No, it, it, it appears to me. It, it comes and goes. 
it doesn't qualify as I. I is that element of your, I is the, the knowing element in your experience. It's not even an, it's not a, a separate subject of experience. It's not located somewhere. You're right. Your attention cannot land on something that you can call I. It's like when you're watching a, um, a movie. This is a conventional movie. You're sitting on your sofa. You cannot, and you're looking for the screen in the movie. You cannot say, there's the screen. The screen is not located in the movie. The screen is all there is to the movie, but you can't find the screen, you can't point to it. So likewise, the knowing with which your experience is known pervades your entire experience. There is no part of your experience that is not pervaded by the knowing of it. All there is to your thoughts is the knowing of them. All there is to the hearing of this conversation is the knowing of it. All there is to the sight of this room is the knowing of it. Knowing is pervades your entire experience. But if I were to ask you now, point to when knowing is located. Where, where, where would your attention go if you tried to find this knowing with your attention? Where would your attention go? Would it go behind the eyes, to your chest? To, where is this knowing located? You can't find it in experience. By experience we mean objective, thinking, feeling, sensing, perceiving. You can't find it in experience, although there's, that's all there is to experience. So in just the same way that a current in the ocean is like a, a contraction of the water, so our attention is like a contraction of knowing or awareness. So when you with your attention, trying to find yourself, try to find this knowing. You're like a, a current in the ocean, searching everywhere for water. You, you're right, with your attention you cannot find yourself. And that's frustrating for your, for your attention, for, for your mind, for your finite mind, because the mind always wants an object to, to know or perceive. So what settles that this understanding. So these, these two eyes, the apparently two I, the, the, the hurtable eye, unhurtable eye. So the eye in both cases is the same eye. The unhurtable eye is just pure naked awareness. And, and that, that, that naked awareness is just pure openness, empty. That is empty of object, n not made of a thought or a feeling. Yes. And it has no limit. It, it's unlimited and it is ever-present. These are its two essential qualities. It, it's, it has no limit and it's ever-present. So this, this I, thoughts, thoughts and feelings add to this I a belief. In fact, two essential beliefs. One, I am limited. Two, I come and go. Thought adds to the true and only I of awareness, these two beliefs, the belief that I am limited and that I come and go. And with that belief, the true and only I of awareness seems to become separate, limited and temporal. It's still the true and only I of awareness, but it now seems to have acquired a limit. That limited self that located self, that temporal self, is the, the thought and feeling made self, the self that is, that is hurtable. But even then, the, the, the I of the separate I 
is the true and only eye of awareness. But it just has an apparent limit. The belief and feeling that I, awareness, am separate, limited, located and temporal makes unlimited, unlimited awareness seem to be limited. That is what the separate self the, is, the apparent limiting of awareness. In other words, the separate self is awareness plus a belief and a feeling. It's, it's, not, it's not that there are two selves. The, the self of awareness and the separate self over here. And the separate self has to do a lot of work and a lot of meditation to finally become the true self. No, there is just one self, if we can call it a self. Another way of putting it would be this. The knowing with which the separate self knows its experience. The knowing with which the separate self knows her experience belongs to awareness, yeah. not, to the, not to a separate self. That would yeah. be another way of putting it. But it's the same knowing, the same I. There's only one I, if we can call it a, an I or a self. It's just knowing or experiencing or awareness. Yes, pure, dimensionless knowing. That's what you are. Yeah. And that knowing can take the shape of a thought that says, I, this empty, dimensionless knowing, am a limited self. So even the thoughts and feelings out of which the separate self is made are made out of the unlimited presence of awareness. Just like even the limited objects that appear in a movie are made out of the unlimited screen. This is why Ramana Maharshi said, when the I is divested of the I, only I remains. When the true and only I of awareness is divested of the I of the separate beliefs and feelings of being a separate self, it remains as it always is, the true and only I of awareness. There are not two eyes. There is there's only one I and that I is not a it's not a self. Don't think of it as a noun. Think of it as a verb. Instead of thinking of it as awareness, a noun, something, think of it as it's knowing. Awareness. Of knowing. Let, let me give you a, um, an, another metaphor. T take space, yeah, like the space of this room, or, but, but take infinite space. Yes? Now add the quality of knowing to it. So now it's a space, but it's a knowing space. Yeah? Now remove the space. What are you left with? Dimensionless knowing. That's awareness. It's made out of pure knowing. I don't mean intellectual knowing, I mean awareing. It is one, present, and two, aware. These are its two qualities. I am, and I know that I am. I am, and the I that I am, knows that I am. It knows itself, knowing and being. And when it is understood that this quality of knowing being is the substance of all our experience, that the third element of our self is revealed. And that is called peace or happiness. Is that what is called Nibbana in other, in a Buddhist context? Um, you no, that's not quite what is called. Nibbana would be a, a stage before that. Nibbana is, is the no-thingness, yeah. is the discovery that what I am is not made of a thing, just pure, empty, knowing being, written all one word. And that what I am has no objective qualities. I am without limits and ever-present. Yes, that's called nirvana. I am no thing. In, in the Sanskrit tradition, it's called nirvikapa samadhi. The, the recognition that what I am is, is just open, empty, limitless knowing. So that, that's nirvana. But now, having discovered that, what about all the rest of this? Yeah. What is my relationship? My this no thingness, this totally alive but no thingness. 
this empty knowing, what is my relationship with all this, all this thingness, all this stuff? The mind, the body, the troublesome mind, body and world. Yeah. yeah? Samsara. What is my relationship with samsara? And in other words, we have to then, uh, the discovery of nirvana is what is called enlightenment or awakening. What I am is ever present and unlimited. That's nirvana, that's enlightenment. It's just a stage on the way, it's not the end. We then have to explore what is my relationship, my this nothingness, what is my relationship with everything, everything else, thoughts, feelings, the world, bodies, relationships. What is the relationship between these two? And if we explore very deeply our experience, we, we find that there are not two there. There isn't I awareness that knows a world. There is just knowing. In the experience of hearing, there isn't one part that hears and another that is heard. There is just hearing. And I am the substance of hearing. Seeing is not divided into a one part that sees and another that is seen. There is just seeing, and I, this empty knowing, pervade the entire field of seeing. It's more than just knowing ourselves as nirvana. It's knowing that, that nirvana and samsara, we can't even say they are the same, because in order to say they are the same, we have to conceptualize these two things in the first place. There aren't two things there in the first place to be one with each other. It's not that they are one, it's that they are non-existent as two in the first place. That is why this understanding is called non-duality, it's not called oneness. The best the mind can do is just say, it's not two. Nobody can tell us who we are. People can tell us about objects, but nobody can tell us about ourself. That is a non-objective discovery that has to be made for ourselves, by ourselves, in ourselves. If thought turns its attention away from the objects which it seems to know and turns its attention back on itself. It ceases to be thought and is revealed as pure consciousness. This open, empty, dimensionless, objectless awareness that we essentially are is not limited by any of the thoughts, feelings, sensations or perceptions that appear within it. It was present prior to the appearance of the body-mind. It is present during the appearance of the body-mind and it remains present after the disappearance of the body-mind. That is not something we discover when we die. We can discover it any moment. All we know of the body-mind is a collection of thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions. And these are continuously appearing and disappearing. But you have never appeared or disappeared. Numerous times every day we experience the appearance and disappearance of the body-mind world. But we never experience the disappearance of ourselves. This is the great discovery to be made about ourselves and this discovery is the source of true peace and happiness. What I essentially am does not share the limits or the destiny of the body mind. And 
until we have made this discovery about ourselves, we cannot really know what anything truly is. Because everything appears in conformity with our belief about ourselves. If we think I am a temporary limited self, we will think that the world is a temporary limited world. Everything appears in conformity with our understanding of ourselves.